SpaceX, Starbase, Cape Canaveral. You got questions, we've got the answers. Thanks for tuning in to episode 77 of Lab Padre's weekly updates. Now let's dig in. Shortly after midnight on Friday, Starship 30's stacking was completed. The ship will be finished with the addition of its flaps, engines, and TPS tiles soon. Early in the afternoon, and making use of Buckner's on-site assembly crane, an aft flap was brought to the high bay and installed on Starship 29. Meanwhile, at Massey's test site, the upper section of the nose cone load testing structure was relocated away from the can crusher testing rig. Over at the launch site, several water tanker trucks were seen refilling the water deluge tanks ahead of another test of the pad deluge system. As the deluge system tanks were being filled, the orbital launch integration tower's chopsticks were raised to keep them high and dry. Over at the build site, the payload bay door was removed from Ship 29 to be worked on at ground level. The descent gave a good view of the door's internal structure. A few hours later, the payload bay door was reinstalled onto Ship 29. The procedure for the door's installation was basically the reverse of the door's removal. After many hours of preparation, the water deluge system was tested under the orbital launch mount. The deluge system sustained a strong spray longer than we saw in previous tests before eventually tapering off. Early Saturday afternoon saw a number of barriers replaced around a large area in front of Mid-Bay as workers began the final preparations for the building's demolition. Work would begin with an excavator equipped with a hydraulic demolition shear, which was brought in and staged for dismantling the Mid-Bay. Demolition of the Mid-Bay began that evening, with the shear making short work of the outer cladding, cutting and tearing off the panels and their supporting frame with ease. Meanwhile, over at the Mega Bay, the first prefabricated section of the new bay's internal stairs was lifted over the walls and lowered into place. After the wrecking claw tore out most of the panels, a cutting torch was used to remove most of the remaining outer cladding from the base of the mid-bay. Working ahead of the arrival of Booster 9, the outer Raptor spin start system on the OLM was tested, which also purged the lines of any debris inside. Monday saw Booster 9 being repositioned inside of the Mega Bay, moving away from the inner corner and towards the doorway. But after sunrise, Booster 9 was repositioned once again inside the Mega Bay, moving back to the sheltered inner corner. Construction began on the next phase of the Star Factory expansion as the new factory continues to grow closer towards Highway 4. A third bridge crane girder for the new Mega Bay was delivered to the build site and will run from left to right in this view of the bay. Once the first four columns and their connecting beams were in place, the first prefabricated roof section on the new Star Factor expansion was put into place. Over at the launch site, the booster quick disconnect was retracted and stowed at low speed ahead of Booster 9's return to the launch pad. Tuesday saw the installation of another cryogenic subcooler for liquid methane at the orbital tank farm. These subcoolers are used to make the propellants more dense when they're loaded onto the rocket. While Booster 9 made its way to the launch site, the chopsticks were raised to the lifting position on the launch integration tower. With its new hot staging interstage in place, Booster 9 was ready to return to the launch pad. After a two-hour journey to the launch site, the booster was placed between the chopsticks and readied for lift. Back at the build site, the first two columns for the taller area of the Star Factory expansion, mirroring the facility at Roberts Road in Florida, were put into place. Once the booster was in position, the chopsticks closed around it, followed by the stabilization hardpoints that kept the rocket level. Once everything was ready, the booster was lifted above the OLM and rotated into position before settling into the launch mount. The next prefabricated roof section was installed on Wednesday, joining the rest of the shorter side of the Star Factory expansion to the first part of the new high assembly hall. With all connections made, Booster 9 began its second test campaign with an igniter test for its 33 Raptor engines. The detonation suppression system under the orbital launch mount were tested next, spraying the area below the engines with gaseous nitrogen and water to disperse any volatile gases. 
After several hours of preparation, Booster 9 conducted a spin prime test, flowing cryogenic oxygen and nitrogen through the system and bringing the turbo pumps up to operational speed. Since the engines were not fired, FireX and the detonation suppression system were used instead of the water deluge system. Inside the high bay, Starship 30 lifted onto the transport stand. The ship will be waiting in the wings for a trip to Massey's for cryogenic proof testing. On Friday afternoon, with a spray of the FireX and pad deluge systems, Booster 9's Raptors roared to life. The static fire test was successful, with 31 of the 33 engines firing for the full duration of the test, avoiding the premature shutdown that was seen in the last previous static fire. After achieving a comparable number of ignited engines as Booster 7 ahead of the first integrated flight test, Booster 9 is likely ready to be qualified for flight. After the static fire test, a launch readiness check was made on the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm with it swinging out from the tower at full speed for a launch. With testing completed, the chopsticks were lowered to the base of the tower and the Starship Quick Disconnect Arm was returned to a neutral position. Thanks once again to Mauricio with RGV Aerial Photography, who took this amazing overhead shot during his flyover on Thursday. In this image, taken about 24 hours before Booster 9's static fire, we can see that much of the area had already been cleared ahead of the test. This incredible view also provides us with an excellent top-down look at the new hot staging ring and its flat-topped base dome that protects the grid fins and other systems on the top of the booster. We can also see some type of white sealant has been placed in the cracks of the Fondag around the outside of the launch mount. It should be interesting to see how this held up after the static fire test and if the Fondag perimeter will need additional work to prepare it for an actual launch in the near future. Over at Cape Canaveral, Friday saw the return of SpaceX recovery ship Doug to port, carrying both fairing halves from the Starlink G6-10 launch. On Saturday, Crosby Skipper returned to port with a short fall of Gravitas and Falcon 9 Booster 1067, likewise from the Starlink 610 mission. The tug Signet Titan towed Just Read the Instructions out to sea in support of the Starlink Group 6-11 mission ahead of its scheduled launch on the 26th. Falcon 9 Booster 1067 was lifted onto the docks on Sunday for stowage and initial post-flight maintenance, freeing up a short fall of Gravitas to support another launch. In the evening, support ship Doug headed to sea in support of the Starlink Group 6-11 launch, where if all goes well, it will perform fairing recovery operations. By Wednesday, Falcon 9 Booster 1067 was ready to return to Roberts Road and was laid onto the horizontal transport for the trip. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week and thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.